I know international students who have died in the time that they were studying here. And two out of the three were Nigerian. This lady was also a social work student in the school that I attended. I don't think I need to say any more for you to understand that the topic around international students' well-being, wellness, welfare is very important to me because I have seen things, I have experienced things. It just goes to confirm my thoughts and my suspicions about what is happening with international students in terms of their well-being and their welfare. As a matter of fact, this video is taking a different direction from the other video I made about international students being scapegoated and basically blamed for everything. By the way, if you would like to see that video, there's going to be a link in the description. In this video, I want to bring things a bit more personal. I want to bring it close to where international students would have a responsibility towards their own welfare and wellness. So I think that to present a balanced view, it is important that we mention all the external influences that impact on international student well-being and wellness, but we can also bring that down to hold a measure of responsibility if we are international students into our own well-being. Unfortunately, as you saw in the thumbnail, I know international students who have died in the time that they were studying here. When I say I know, I don't know these people personally, okay, but somehow I have got to hear about their stories and two out of the three international students were Nigerian. And then one was from another African country, either Sierra Leone or Liberia. I think it would be Sierra Leone. And this lady who unfortunately lost their lives was also a social work student in the school that I attended. Even if I have not had a very close experience of knowing these people personally, I'm of the opinion that these particular incidents are a lot closer to home because two of them were Nigerian and the other one was studying in the same school, the same course as myself. I didn't meet her in the time that she was studying. Maybe she was in the cohort after me or the cohort before me. I never ever met her in my classes. However, how I even came to know about it, I first of all heard the story, I think on Facebook, I read about it on Facebook, but somehow that story stayed with me. And then sometime when I was in school, the social work student that I was sharing a class with, I believe we were in the same group assignment, started asking me if I knew this student from ACAP who had died. And I'm like, no, but from all the description, I suspected that it would be the same person that I had seen their story on Facebook. These were people who looked reasonably okay, were functioning okay. They probably had jobs that they were going to, they were attending classes and everything seemed to be fine. And for all of them, these were really young people. And of course it is not normal. Yes, we know that young people lose their lives every day, but it is not a normal thing for a young person who appears to be hale and hearty, well and all of that, going home and not waking up the following morning. Something must have happened. And so I am just bringing this up to highlight the importance of looking after ourselves. Another reason why I have often thought about these incidents is also because I remember what the experience was like for me looking after myself while I was an international student. Actually, there was no experience of looking after myself because I wasn't looking after myself. It's as simple as that. I wasn't really paying attention where I should have been paying attention. Anything could have happened in that time. I am just happy and grateful that things did not go down that path, like things did not become that bad for my family and myself, where someone lost their lives or someone passed. It didn't get that bad. But looking back now, I know that I was gambling with my life. I was taking a big risk with my life, not looking after myself. I mentioned in passing in one of my other videos how I have ended up in the emergency department in the hospital a few times on the basis of health issues that I overlooked. And these health issues became more pronounced in the time that I was an international student. Some of them even developed while I was an international student. And I also spoke in that video about fainting, yeah? How I fainted one day, I was at home doing my assignment and the next thing I knew was that I had fainted. I didn't know that I fainted because you don't know when you faint. It's only when you regain consciousness and then you try to piece things together 
to understand how you got to that state. So that was exactly what happened to me. I did not go into the details of that story, but I am going to tell you now. So on that very beautiful day, I was at home trying to complete an assignment. And I was rushing through this assignment because, you know, I believe it must have been due really soon, which is often the case with students, right? Some of us tend to leave things until the very last minute. So I know that there was a sense of urgency around the assignment I was trying to complete. On that day, I took the children to their care place. So where they would be looked after in the time that I would go to school or in the time that I would go to work. I had taken them there earlier, first because I wanted to take advantage of a quiet house to get that assignment done, but also get ready to go to school after that, or maybe it would have been go to go to work after that, right? I don't remember, but I felt it was a better arrangement for me to have taken them to their care place earlier. So I remember being on the dining table, writing my assignment with, you know, I had my laptop in front of me and I had my notebook, and then the next thing I remember was me coming to. So me regaining consciousness and I was on the floor. I do not remember how I ended up on the floor. And it was only after I looked at the time that I tried to piece together how long I had been lying on the floor for unconscious. And that was when I knew, as we would say in Nigeria, that water don't pass Gary. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, I had been having this um, chest pain and it was becoming more frequent and more intense. So it started off as chest pain that I would feel maybe once every couple of months and then it reduced to a monthly thing. At some point it was like I couldn't go a whole week without experiencing one or two of those episodes of chest pain. It became that bad. And you know what? I did speak to my GP about it, but I don't remember them offering any kind of solution to it. So I too did not take it serious. And so this thing kept getting worse. On the day that I fainted, obviously, when I came to, I quickly ran off to the GP. I don't even remember whether I eventually made it to class or to work that day. I ran off to my GP to talk to them about what had happened. Obviously, the episode had passed, so I didn't think it was necessary for me to present at emergency because I wasn't feeling the pain anymore. I went to my GP and that was when they ordered a whole batch of tests. From there, I went on to see a cardiologist and they recommended an echocardiogram. I don't know if that's what they call it, echo something something. It's been a while now. I did all of those tests they told me that my cholesterol was high but nothing specific to the pain in my chest you know there were times when I would google you already know you shouldn't google your symptoms right because google is basically going to tell you you're dying the following day but yeah I googled my symptoms and when I read that sometimes pain that travels from one part of your body to the other might be indicative of uh, a stroke or a heart attack or something Oh my goodness, I felt like basically I was going to die because sometimes this pain would start off in my chest and then travel up to my throat. It didn't travel down my arm or down my back or into my jaw as I read in relation to strokes and heart attacks and things like that. But just the fact that sometimes I felt the pain here, sometimes it was in my throat, I felt like, oh, <laughs> I am having a heart attack, I am having a stroke and I am going to die soon. Yeah, but that was when I started taking it seriously. And then that was also when I sat down to think about my symptoms. There were lots of symptoms. I was having this condition called hematuria, so blood in the urine. Yeah, I know that this is too much information, but I am only going into this much detail to tell you how negligent I was about my health. And I am not saying that everyone is going to experience the symptoms, obviously we are all different, but I am saying how quickly these things progressed. I only, I only studied for two years, but those two years in many ways were like the longest two years of my life. But at the same time, when I think about it sometimes, it's like those two years went by really quick. And to think that in just two years, my health would deteriorate this much it, it, it was quite baffling. So I had hematuria, I had this uh, chest pain thing going on. Um, I developed um, hair suitism, so excessive hair growth. And much later, I would come to realize that it most likely had to do with unbalanced hormones. 
So my hormones became wild. They went rogue. I was growing hair all over my body in very unlikely places. And then I, I also started growing a lot of skin tags, skin tags and moles. For those of you who have been watching me long enough, if you went back and, and watched some of my old videos, you would see those skin tags, especially on my face. I used to have one very huge one on this spot, somewhere on this spot. And I had other very visible ones. Okay, I have since got rid of them, but that was what was happening. It was like every month or every week even. At some point, I felt like maybe these things were popping up every week. There was a new one popping up every week on my neck, on my chest. I even had skin tags on my back. It was crazy. All these things were just growing. And I have also mentioned that usually when things begin to happen to me, the very first place it manifests is on my skin. Listen, sometimes I, I look at my pictures from, um, that would have been five years ago since I finished my studies, right? Let's count. Almost six years ago since I finished. Sometimes I look at my pictures from six years ago and compare them to now. And guess what? I looked older back then than I look today. My skin was always dry and flaky. I just looked stressed, okay? The stress was showing on my body. But I understand in the time that you're studying, there will be lots of conflicting priorities, especially if you're a self-funded international student or partially self-funded. So if you have to raise some or all of your school fees by yourself, you don't have a sponsor, someone who is funding your education and you don't have to worry about tuition. But even if you didn't have to worry about tuition, for a lot of international students, they still have to work to maintain their daily expenses here in Australia. So it's a very hard place to be where you are studying full time and you still have to maintain a job. And you know how it is as an international student, sometimes it feels like you're being forced to study. <laughs> yes, you choose to come here and study, you choose your course. But the fact that it's not easy for you to reduce your study load, it's not easy to drop your studies if things become really difficult and defer to another time. You can do all of these things, but what I'm saying is that it is difficult, it is massively difficult. You have to bring all sorts of evidence, bring all sorts of supporting documents before you can get an approval to reduce your study load or get an approval to defer your studies or suspend your studies. Any of these things that domestic students can do without batting an eyelid. For an international student, you have to think very carefully. Sometimes when you defer your studies or reduce your study load, then it can potentially affect your visa. And some schools would tell you that dropping your study load or doing any kind of variation to your enrollment will require them to report to the Department of Home Affairs. And of course, that's something you don't want to hear as an international student. So that's what I mean by sometimes it feels like you're forced to study and study a full-time load until you graduate. So when you think about all those things, you just keep pushing through. There is pain in your body, but you just keep pushing through. You're not feeling mentally well, you just have to push through. You don't have an option. And this is where I am saying you have to look after yourself. You have to look after yourself. I have heard many stories of people who appear to be fine. They were healthy. They were going to work and coming back and just going about their daily lives and their personal business. And then one day they've gone to bed and they didn't wake up or they have slumped at work and that was it for them. Or it's been, you know, you hear a lot of these kind of crazy stories where people have passed under very shocking circumstances, circumstances that were not anticipated, not expected. And unfortunately, this is also a story that I have heard in relation to international students. So please, if you're an international student, okay, that one extra shift that you think you must take will not be what makes a difference in the long run in relation to whether you complete your studies on time, whether you pay your tuition fees on time. It is better that you stay alive than to basically kill yourself in the process of wanting to be on time with everything. If being on time is coming at the expense of your health and your well-being, then you really, really need to rethink your priorities and set your priorities right. Your health will always come first, and that includes your mental health. Now, there are resources in the universities that you attend or in the colleges that you attend. Please try and make use of those resources. 
if you need to speak to a counsellor, please speak to a counsellor. One of the concerns I have heard from international students is that they don't want to speak to a counsellor from school because they fear that it's not a confidential service and somehow the knowledge that they have accessed counselling will be used against them and used against their academic progression. But that's not true. These services are confidential and they're actually there to help you. If you're struggling with your units, please speak to an academic advisor. Don't keep it to yourself. If you've got some kind of unit coordinator, please speak to them about it. A lot of students go through school and they do not even realize that there is a separate department in most universities I know here in Australia. There's like a whole department, a whole unit of the university that is dedicated to looking after international students' well-being and welfare. Okay, all students, not just international students, but many students do not feel comfortable approaching the services. Many students do not even know that these services exist. Many students do not know how to access these services. So my encouragement to you today is for you to try and find out those pastoral care units. And when it comes to working and studying, you just have to pace yourself. Have intentional self-care days. And those self-care days, you can do whatever or you can do nothing. Please try and find a hobby. Or if you've kind of let your hobby fall by the wayside as a result of all these pressures, this is the time for you to go back and pick up that hobby. These are the things that will ensure at the end of the day that you're physically healthy and mentally balanced as well. Now, if you are an international student watching this video, please let other people know in the comment section what you do to look after yourself okay so what are the things that you do to ease the pressure but also i did make a video it's an old video but still a very relevant and useful video i made a video about how you can access supports from the university that you're studying in or the institution where you're studying okay so I am going to leave that video to come right after this one. Click on the link following this video and watch that one about how you can access available supports. And that would include things like study support, um, counseling support, financial assistance as well. Yes, I know that some universities offer financial bursaries for students. This is very separate to scholarships. I'm not talking about scholarships, okay? Please check out that video. It's going to come right after this one. There will be a link on the screen. And I'll see you again in my next one. Don't forget to like this one before you go. Bye-bye.